All right, Cindy. Well, thank you so much for being with me today. I have reviewed your posts, kind of media communication, and I can tell that you are super passionate, driven, fun. Uh, for our listeners, you can't see Cindy right now, but she's wearing a shirt that says makelovenotporn.com. So we're going to hear a little bit more than about that. But I'm excited to have our conversation today. I want to hear so much about you. So why don't we start with your background story, where you're from, and how you got started in your career? Sure. Um, so I'm half English, half Chinese. Um, my father was English. My mother is Malaysian Chinese. I was born in the UK, but when I was six, we moved to Brunei in Borneo. So I grew up in Brunei and went back to the UK for school and university. I read English literature at um, Somerville College, Oxford University. And I actually fell in love with theatre at Oxford and began my career in theatre marketing and then transitioned to work in advertising, which has formed the bulk of my background ever since. Wow, what an incredible background. And you're living, you said, in New York City right now? Um, I am indeed. I moved to New York 24 years ago to start up the American office of the ad agency I used to work for, Bartle Bogle Hegarty, BBH. But very soon after I arrived in New York, I went, I found my spiritual home. I'm never going back to London. And so I'm now a New Yorker for life. That's awesome. I love your apartment. It looks so light and airy. And I, she has a plant for those of you guys that can't see. I'm a good plant lover as well. So can you share a little bit with us about what projects you're currently working on that you're excited and passionate about right now? Sure. So um, there's only one thing that I work on, which is my business, Make Love Not Porn. We are pro-sex pro porn, pro knowing the difference. So we are the world's first and only user generated human curated social sex video sharing platform. So we are what Facebook would be if Facebook allowed you to socially sexually self express. If porn is the Hollywood blockbuster movie, make love not porn is the documentary. We're a unique window onto the funny, messy, loving, beautiful, comical, awkward, hilarious sex we all have in the real world. And so what, what we're doing is we're socializing sex. We're normalizing it to make it easier for everyone to talk about, to promote consent, communication, good sexual values, and good sexual behavior. And so we call ourselves the social sex revolution. The revolutionary part is not the sex, it's the fact we're making it social. So for people who are listening right now, would they say, what's the difference between you and porn? I know this is really kind of a social justice. You're trying to, you know, socialize sex and make it comfortable, obviously creating probably a psychosocial comfortable relationship. But tell me if I, as a user, what would I do to find you and what would I um, discover once I got to you? Sure. Um, so first of all, it's very important to say that Make Love Not Porn is a business. I am all about doing good and making money simultaneously. And so my aim with Make Love Not Porn is to change the way the world has sex for the better and make a huge amount of money doing it, just to, just to be very clear, um, especially because I'm raising funding for Make Love Not Porn at the moment. And so um, essentially, we are pioneering a whole new category on the internet that has never existed before, social sex. And so, you know, to, um, Make Love Not Porn doesn't compete with porn. Um, we are a unique counterpoint and complement. Um, our competition is actually Facebook and YouTube, or it would be if they allowed you to socially, sexually self-express, uh, which they sadly do not. And so social sex videos on Make Love Not Porn are not about performing for the camera. They're simply about doing what we all already do on every other social platform in every other area of our lives, which is capture what goes on in the real world as it happens spontaneously, in all its funny, messy, glorious, wonderful, fabulous humanness. And that has a tremendous amount of benefits. Because for example, social sex videos on Make Love Not Porn are enormously reassuring. Because we celebrate real world everything. Real world bodies, real world hair, real world penis size, real world breast size, real world vulvas. And the reason that's so important, Hannah, is because you can talk body positivity all you like. You can preach self-love till you're blue in the face. At the end of the day, nothing makes us feel great about our own bodies. Like seeing people who are no one's idea of aspirational body types getting turned on by each other, desiring each other, having an amazing time in bed. And so, you know, in a world where popular culture every day sends us messages that tell us you are not 
hot, sexually charged and desirable, unless you are this skinny, six pack abs, look like this. Our members say to us, you made me feel better about my own body. You know, one man wrote and said, my girlfriend and I now feel able to be more open and central with each other because you made each of us feel better about our own bodies. But that's such a big compliment. I mean, you can't get bigger compliment than that, that you make me want to be myself and you encourage and allow me to be myself in public in front of millions of people, right? Tell me about your your listener size and um, how people would go about finding you. Sure. So um, it's viewers because we're not just, you know, we we are video. Um, And so um, you can find us at makelovenotporn.tv. And um, we um, welcome you to come and watch our amazing social sex videos, but we also welcome you to consider becoming a contributor or as we call it, a Make Love Not Porn Star. Because our Make Love Not Porn Stars tell us that socially sharing their real world sex on Make Love Not Porn has been as transformative for them and their relationships as socially sharing everything else on social media has been for the world at large. So for example, um, we have many solo videos, you know, male, female, trans, non-binary, um, make love and porn stars who have shared this really intimate act of masturbation on make love, not porn. And by the way, most of our contributors have never filmed themselves doing anything sexual before ever. They're doing it for us because they believe in our social mission. So our solo make love, not porn stars tell us that doing that made them love themselves more. It actually enhanced their sexual sense of self, their sexual self-esteem. Couples tell us it transformed their relationship. Because when you decide to film yourselves having sex, you have to talk about it. And when you talk about it, it doesn't matter how long you've been together, the conversation goes places it's never, ever gone before. Couples write and say, we thought we were open. Doing this just took our relationship to a whole new level. That's wonderful. Oh my gosh, I'm I'm kind of visualizing those those conversations. Do you guys support um dialogue or kind of prompts conversation prompts around that do you have something on your website that says where do I even start right with filming if I say to my husband gosh I want to be on Cindy's make love lot lot porn you know how do we even start that conversation oh oh, oh, yeah no no no, absolutely so so we have a whole make love not porn star resource corner where we have tips and tricks on how to film your real world sex And by the way, I should just explain that we have a revenue sharing business model, so you can make money. Our members pay to subscribe, rent and stream social sex videos. Half that income goes to our Make Love Not Porn Stars. Um, But actually, we find um, that um, quite often, you know, people join as members, really enjoy watching our videos and go, ooh, I quite fancy doing that. And so just watching, if you're a couple watching our videos together, you know, is a great way to kind of, you know, A, get in the mood, have a hot time, but also go, oh, it could be fun to do that ourselves. And, and, and then other, other contributors have read about us somewhere and just go, wow, you know, that could be really fun. And, and what's fascinating to me, Hannah, is I'm continually blown away, not just by how well Make Love Not Porn does things I design it to do, but how well it does things that I never designed to do. Mm. What I mean by that is, in the what I designed to do camp, you know, we hear from couples all the time who say, you saved our relationship, you saved our marriage, you know, hadn't had sex in years, watch your videos, kaboom. On the what I never consciously designed to do front, you know, we get amazing emails from survivors of rape, sexual abuse, sexual assault, um, from female and male and trans and non-binary survivors. Yeah who tell us that Make Love Not Porn help them reclaim their bodies. You know, we help them feel able to be sexual again. Um, In a scenario, obviously, porn is way too triggering. And honestly, that's a use case I never thought of when I had this idea. And I'm just so moved and touched and grateful that we're able to help in that way. I love what you said earlier about you can't preach body positivity if you're not showing it and acting or giving mm. examples of body positivity. There are a lot of companies, and I know you support this, living in the advertising cop- capital of the world, right, New York, where it's a company will suddenly decide we're going to do body positivity, and they've hired models their whole entire campaigns, and all of a sudden they're like, "Gosh, we got to get some black, brown." larger people, Asian people, sure, you know, we we have to get this campaign and we've got to get eight people that look normal, right? But what you're doing is saying, let's go back to ordinary people, normal people, everyday people who have sexual needs, have body positivity issues now more than ever. And let's just put it out, literally put it all out there. How did you come up with this idea? 
Well, um, to, well, um, um, in the in the first instance, you know, I came up with the idea for Make Love Not Porn because I date younger men. Um, they tend to be in their twenties. And 14, 15 years ago, I began realizing through dating younger men that when we don't talk openly and honestly about sex in the real world, porn becomes sex education by default yes. in not a good way. And so I decided something about that. I put up a tiny clunky website on no money at makelovenotporn.com that in its original iteration was just copy, you know, porn world versus real world. I had the opportunity to launch it at TED in 2009. I became the only TED speaker to say the words come on my face on the TED stage six times. Um, the talk went viral as a result. It drove this extraordinary response. And I realized I'd uncovered a huge global social issue. Yes. And so I turned Make Love Not Porn into the business it is today as the solution. But, but at a more profound level, Hannah, I designed all of my own beliefs and philosophies into Make Love Not Porn. And, and to your point about, you know, um, diversity and what is really sexually attractive in the real world. Um, a few years ago, um, the extremely popular UK TV show Love Island announced their new season. I watch Island. every season. I'm a fan. Okay. <laughs> so, so um, a few years back, um, they announced their new season lineup, and they were instantly criticised for lack of diversity. Mm -hmm. They were criticised for lack of ethnic diversity and of body diversity. And the producer of Love Island was interviewed about this and made the enormous mistake of saying, well, we have to cast what people find attractive. So the entire internet came down to his head, including me. And the Daily Mail actually published my tweet in an article they wrote about this, because I responded to that and I said, walk through any park in any big city in the summer, in any country in the world, and look at the couple sitting on the grass, holding hands, kissing, and you will see what people actually find hot and desirable in the real world. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Walk down any street in any city or town, look at the people holding hands and kissing, and you will see how hot and desirable every single one of us is in the real world. And so make love not poor, we celebrate that because, you know, um, we are showcasing what people really find attractive versus what popular culture tells you you should find attractive. Absolutely. I love this, Cindy. I think the listeners that we have for the She Burns podcast are women, many of them who are suffering from burnout. And my in my coaching conversations and thousands conversations with thousands of women, the sex and the intimacy is the first to go. Um, and they're missing intimacy with themselves. So I love what you're saying around, you know, being yourself, putting yourself out there literally as we've approached, you know, kind of the, hopefully the end of COVID in the last two and a half years, what has that been or done to your business? I can imagine people are at home more, they're more isolated. Those intimate issues are really rising, right? You're having to be with your partners in such close quarters. Talk to me about how has that been for you in this industry in general? Sure. Um, so the pandemic has been very good for Make Love Not Porn. Uh, I mean, first of all, a very practical level, we're, we're an entirely digital business. And so, um, you know, while we did have a little office that we gave up when, when obviously lockdown happened, um, my team and I are all very happy working remotely. So, you know, no impact on that front. And then, you know, what has been really great for us is, is two interesting dynamics that I've seen come out of the pandemic. The first is the pandemic has absolutely proven that what we all thought for years is not true. Because for years we went, the future's digital, AR this, VR that, boy oh boy. Has the pandemic ever proven that what we are all desperate for on the other side of this is intimacy, uh -huh. human touch, connection, love, relationships, feelings, sex. Yes. And we are a platform that celebrates all of that. And then the second interesting dynamic is, and, and again, you know, we're a global platform. Every observation I'm making is global. So, you know, we have all been in lockdown globally. And when you have whole families in lockdown for months on end, you know, couples in lockdown, you know, roommates in lockdown. Um, what you see is a breaking down of the usual societal barriers of guilt, shame and embarrassment around perfectly normal human body functions and sex. So, you know, if you're a family in lockdown together, hug among for months on end, you've got to face up to the fact that behind that closed bedroom door, your teenage son is wanking to porn hub. Okay, if you're the kids, you've got to face up the fact behind that closed door, your parents are having sex, ew, you know, but, 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 but so we absolutely see that 
that is very good for getting people more at ease mm -hmm. with all of these things. Yes. And in fact, um, increasingly, parents have said to us, I am buying subscriptions to make love not porn for my kids because I want them to see what happy, healthy, loving sex relationships look like. Oh, wow. I love this. This is really a game changer for industry in general, but then also conversation starters with families, not just in the yeah. privacy, kind of literally putting it all out yeah. there. As a female entrepreneur, did you have any major expectations that you were placing on yourself during this time of COVID as you're seeing kind of this global change and in intimacy and your business literally blowing up. I know people like to call you um, that you like a woman, you're a woman who likes to blow shit up. I love, I love that um, comment, but what expectations did you place on yourself? Or you were like, Hey, I mean, whatever happens, happens. Oh, well, you know, um, basically um, I saw an opportunity to finally raise the kind of funding that we deserve, Hannah, because um, I've been parallel pathing two things for 13 years, working to build Make Love Not Porn and working to change the cultural and business context around it. Mm -hmm. Because when you have a truly world changing startup, you have to change the world to fit it, not yes. the other way around. Absolutely. And so, you know, the good news is, is that with the pandemic, with all of that work, the barriers are falling. And so I have just opened up a fundraising round for $20 million to scale Make Love Not Porn. And by the way, it's that substantial because I've battled huge obstacles to keep Make Love Not Porn going for 10 years on only $3 million worth of funding. Mm. And in a world where 75% of all startups fail within the first five years, that's a major achievement. Yeah. And so now I want to raise the kind of funding that will enable us to scale globally to be the Facebook of social sex, which is how bigger I want us to be. And I feel that investors are finally there and are willing to get behind us. So, so that's, that's the really encouraging momentum and progress that I've seen. That's really exciting. And I'm hoping that people are listening right now saying, I want to be part of that change, whether it's mm. emotional change, social change, mm. or financial change. What is one thing as an entrepreneur, Cindy, that you feel holds you back from, from living this purpose, living this movement, living this dream other than money, right? What do you think has been kind of your biggest barrier as a female entrepreneur other than money? <laughs> um, well, well, honestly, first and foremost, Hannah, because I speak to this all the time, um, it is lack of access to capital. Okay, mm -hmm. it, it is money. Um, th th that is the single barrier holding of us back. If you ask me what the next biggest is, um, honestly, it's sexism and bias. Mm. You know, it, it is absolutely um, the belief out there in a male dominated tech industry, a male dominated finance world, a male dominated business world, that women are not as good as men. And that's absolute total bollocks. Mm -hmm. You know, so, um, and again, that's what, what every one of us encounters every single day. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, um, the solution to that is money. Because when we get the capital we deserve, we can scale our businesses and prove that through the female lens, mm -hmm. we can absolutely make a shit ton of money and change the world yeah. in very different ways to what we see playing out all around us in every sector currently, especially in tech, which is my sector. You're so so, mm -hmm. so, um, so that, that, that's the opportunity. And honestly, you know, access to capital overcomes all other obstacles for us. I've had a couple of people on the podcast that have that same exact answer. I always like to look intrinsically as well as a woman, you know, money is almost like we have to have it, right? It's the game changer. Ooh. Money is the Ooh. game changer, Ooh. but it's also what's inside of us too, as founders. A lot of women founders don't make it, um, whether they have the money or not, because they get in their own way at times, there's obstacles as well. What would you say to women entrepreneurs who are listening, who are at a pivotal point in their business, right? They close it down or they get that capital. What advice would you give them, an entrepreneur who is at a crossroads in their point of business? Sure. So what I always say, Hannah, is never waste your time banging your head against closed doors. Engineer yourself into a position where doors open automatically as you approach. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you my own example of that, because um, uh, right now, as I said, I'm raising funding. And, and, and here's my challenge on the investor front, which I would urge other female founders who are feeling despondent to think about in this way as well. So I know that my investors are out there. There are a ton of them okay. in every country in the world. They are impossible to find by the usual means because mm -hmm. they all have one thing in common. Your willingness to fund Make Love Not Porn is entirely a function of your personal sexual journey. Correct. 
it is a function of your personal lens on sex and sexuality driven by your own experience. Okay. And I have no way to research and target for that. Not least because sex is the one area where you cannot tell from the outside what anybody thinks on the inside. I agree with that. <laughs> the, people, the people who look like they would totally get it don't. The people who look like complete prudes do. And so my strategy has been, I put what I'm doing out there all the time. Mm -hmm. I promote Make Love and Not Porn across all my social channels. You know, I do every media interview I'm asked to. I'm thrilled to go on every podcast I'm invited on to. Because I have to I'm making those synaptic connections that will draw those investors to me. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a long, slow, painful, somewhat inefficient process. But the good news is it works. And it's been working more and more in recent years. And so what I would say to female founders is there is always somebody out there who will fund you. There is always somebody out there who will open doors for you. You have to put what you're doing out there in order to attract those people to you. Because Hannah, I'm a big believer in be your own filter. Mm -hmm. And, and again, my own example of that is, um, as you said, um, you know, my tagline on LinkedIn, on Twitter is I like to blow shit up. I'm the Michael Beard business. Now, I don't put that out there as a bit of whimsy or creativity, a bit of fun. I do that entirely deliberately because when I characterize what I do in that way, it attracts me the people who want what I do. It repels the ones who don't. And I want to repel the ones who don't because they're a waste of time, effort, and money. They're the closed so, doors. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. So female founders, put what you're doing out there, be your own filter, and you will attract you the people who want it, will pay for it, will fund it, and will help you with it. I love that, Cindy. I've experienced that myself as a female founder. And one of the things that I'm trying to work with other women about and, and being the entrepreneur circle, and I belong to two accelerators right now, is the sense of competition that we've all faced at one point or another and from a women's standpoint. So we know that men get the funding. We know that men typically, we live in a patriarchal society, but there's also a lot of women, especially as you enter the business world where they only believe there's a couple seats at the table and they'll do everything they can to, to move you out of the way. And if you are a threat, some women frankly don't support you coming in. So what has been your relationship like as you've evolved over your career about that sense of a competition that we've all faced at one time or another? And how has connecting with other women to achieve your goals changed you? Right. So first of all, Hannah, um, because I, I, I've said this a lot over the years, what you've just talked about um, is a syndrome that is entirely caused by men. I call it Highlander syndrome. There can be only one. In a male dominated business world, in a male dominated industry, which every industry is, women know there is only ever room for one token woman on the leadership team, on the board, on the project. And that is what forces women to compete with other women, a dynamic I deplore. It's the fault of men. Mm -hmm. In a gender equal world, in a world where in many industries, it should be female dominated, like my industry advertising. We women are the primary targets of advertising. It's ludicrous that advertising is a male dominated industry. Um, that, would, that wouldn't happen. And to be perfectly honest, I mean, I've never, ha I've, I've never encountered that. I've never encountered women who are anything other than collaborative and supportive. And, you know, I, th I think that's happening more and more as, as we understand the opportunity that we have as women to come together and remake the world to be the way we want it to be. Absolutely. What do you do when you're feeling like that is such a big task, right? I know when I started my company just a year ago, right? And we've accomplished so much in one year, but just, it seems like such a steep hill to climb, right? I mean, we're talking about thousands of years of patriarchal society and that weight of our shoulders, you know, coming down on us. Do we just keep trying day after day? Um, is it big global movements like yours and mine? Like, what is the solve? Like, how do we mic make those micro moves day to day? So, um, so two responses to that, Hannah. The first is, you know, I have for years taken issue with Sheryl Sandberg and her message of lean in because Sheryl wants us to lean in within the existing system, and I want us to redesign the system. Mm. And that is why I say to women all the time, start your own industry. Yes. But I deliberately articulate like that because when you start your own business, you can make it work any way you want it to. You can design it to work the way you want to work. And when you do that, you are starting the industry that we all want to live and work in. The second thing I recommend to women is, and again, I've been saying this for years, I want every one of us to get very, very angry. 
And I say that because we're not meant to. Yeah. My skills don't do that. But when we get angry, we make shit happen. Uh, and that's why so you know, true. The, yeah. the thing that keeps me going through all of the obstacles I face on a daily basis building Make Love Not Porn, you know, um, the dynamic that that absolutely gets me through all of that is the one I characterize as I'm going to fucking well show you. You tell me it can't be done, I'm going to fucking well show you. You put an obstacle in my path, I'm going to fucking well show you. I have to channel all of that depression, demoralization, you know, difficulty into inspiration and motivation. And I get angry about it and I go, I'm going to fucking well show you. Ooh, I'm so fired up right now. I'm like smiling because I feel like I should be angry, but the, the anger is from within and I feel like it's like pouring out. And when I started She Shatters, everyone said, don't start a company just for women. And I said, why wouldn't I start a company for just women? Oh my God, Hannah, again, as I've been saying for years, there is a huge amount of money to be made out of taking women seriously. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think there is a proven fact that when we get angry, when we get passionate, we can do anything. And that's not just blowing fluff. I think about of each other's asses. It's truly the case. I mean, look at all the things that we've been able to accomplish. But when you are feel stuck though, Cindy, what are some strategies you've learned to adopt? I mean, I know you just said getting angry, but from a psychological standpoint or lack of burnout or self-care or whatever buzzword you want to fucking use, what are you doing and what are some strategies that you've leaned on over the years? Right. So, um, so a couple of answers to that. First of all, um, I'm a great believer in micro actions because I believe that change happens from the bottom up, not the top down. Um, so micro actions are incredibly small, simple, easy to do actions. So easy, why would you do them? And every one of us every day taking micro actions to change what we want to see change cumulatively adds up at scale to enormous impact. Yeah. So if anybody feeling, feeling stuck, I go do something, do a micro action. It doesn't matter how small it is. The very act of doing something makes you feel differently about yourself and your capabilities. And then, and then the other thing I would say is, you know, because, you know, running a sex tech startup is, is enormously stressful. And so um, what I do is every day I go, okay, Cindy, today you are only allowed to stress about one thing. Ooh, I love that. And, and, and yes. want to solve that. You know, maybe, you know, sometimes I've got a huge enough, you know, maybe at the most two things. The point being, I go, okay, today, I'm just gonna focus on this. I'm gonna figure out how I can solve that. And if I can get that done in some form or other, today is a good day and tomorrow I'll move on to the next thing. Mm. And so I get very focused. And, and again, if you like, you know, turn the things I'm stressing about into micro actions, one action at a time, where I will fix this, and then I'll move on to the 15 other things that are competing for mind space. I love that. What do you think was the biggest, brightest spot for you this past year? I know a lot of people think COVID was such a negative thing. And you talked earlier in the conversation around what we learned in general regarding COVID and the intimacy solve. But what was the brightest spot for you when you think and you're like lying in bed at night and you're like, God, COVID brought me this? Honestly, um, the brightest spot for me is just how brilliant my tiny team at Make Love Not Porn has been mm -hmm. through a very difficult time for all of us and, and a very difficult time on Make Love Not Porn because of our bootstrapping nature mm -hmm. and the many issues we run into. You know, my head of curation, Ariel Martinez, my head of sales, Abigail Minor, my curator, um, Angie Cosmo, and my brilliant CTO, who only recently came on board, and so we're not announcing her publicly just yet until she's working on a rebuild of, of our site. But honestly, you know, my um, small but perfectly formed team at Make Love Not Porn has been a very bright spot through some very difficult times. And as an entrepreneur, we cannot do it alone. I mean, is the team around us that truly makes or breaks exactly. us, and I do firmly believe that. I love that. What advice would you give to our listeners or to yourself, like looking back um, on how to be a game changer in your industry? You mentioned initially as a female, start a business that you want to propel yourself into the future. But what advice would you give about just being a game changer wherever a woman's at, whether it's tech, healthcare, banking, what, what advice would you give? It's very simple, Hannah. Don't give a damn what anybody else thinks. Fear of what other people will think is the single most paralyzing dynamic in business and in life. You will never own the future if you care what other people think. So that's all you have to do to be a game changer. Don't give a damn what anyone else thinks. 
And that's easier said than done. I mean, I think I'm writing a book right now. It's called From Ordinary to Extraordinary. And what I learned during pandemic was I was living an unconscious life, Cindy. I was just going day to day. I was living this. I call it, I shitted myself, like shitted myself. But I kept saying, I should do this. I should do that. And a lot of women are paralyzed with that fear and giving a shit about what everyone thinks. But it's also what you should be doing. And it's that patriarchal society that we talked about. What? How do you shift from living an unconscious, ordinary life to living an extraordinary life where you don't give a shit about what people say and you are learning the journey from the inside out versus outside in? What would you say? Sure. I mean, and by the way, decisions made out of fear are always very bad decisions. Um, The the starting point is, again, something, you know, I've been saying for years. Um, It's very simple. Take a long, hard look inside yourself and identify what you stand for, what you believe in, what you value, what you're all about, because that makes life so much easier. Life still throws you all the shit it always will, but you know how to respond to that in any given situation in a way that is true to you. And that is the secret of happiness, living your life and working your work according to your values in a way that is true to you. Yeah, absolutely. I think looking intrinsically is really tough when so many people value productivity and output and the external factors versus the internal factors. So awesome advice. So we're going to switch a little bit to the fun part of the podcast, which I know you're super fun. So this is going to be awesome. Here's where I get to ask you some fun and food for thought questions. Um, So I'd love to hear your answer on this one. If you entered a talent show, you probably have, what would you enter and what talent would your talent be? Um, and actually, I've never entered a talent show. But, <laughs> really? Uh, yeah, yeah, really. But um, but um, but, but if I if I did enter a talent show, um, um, my, my talent really is speaking. Um, I, I'm I'm a very very good speaker, and so I would probably you know um, declaim a poem or you know a a speech of some sort from something yeah. um, that I would look to kind of you know communicate as compellingly as possible. I loved your TED talk. If you were to do another one, what would it be? If I were to do another TED talk, it would absolutely be Make Love Not Porn 13 years on and mm-hmm. how that original TED talk changed my life and the impact Make Love Not Porn has had on the world um, in all those years since. Oh my God, I can't wait. I hope you do it. I want to watch it. <laughs> Cindy, here's my last question. It's a little bit reflective in nature, but if you knew that you could not fail, right, what next leap of faith would you take? You know, the interesting thing is, Hannah, I do exactly what I'm doing now, working to build and scale Make Love Not Porn, because that is my mission. You know, as the saying goes, the path appeared. And, you know, um, I don't even think of failure because we hear every day from our members who tell us how much we've changed their lives. Mm. And so I'm just determined to make that succeed. And somehow I really believe that about you. I think you are in the right place at the right time doing the right work. And I just love what you're doing. So thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. The work you're doing to address, you know, a sense of belonging and diversity in our world and tackling the tough subject of psychological safety, intimacy, and sex is so needed in this world. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge, passion, and insight with us today. Thank you for having me on.